Okay. Dave, nice to see you. Great to see you, and thanks for joining us uh, here on uh, Critical Communications Week. And hi to all the audience. We're uh, we're live from uh, Sonderburg, uh, Denmark, uh, in our uh, office, our new uh, our new demo room. So uh, um, thanks for joining us uh, today. We're going to talk about uh, interoperability between technologies. Uh, that's uh, that's a broad topic, Hauke. It is. By the way, my name is Hauke Holm. I'm Dave Thuringer, and uh, I, I think we should draw a box around uh, what it is that we're going to try and and and, and uh, capture here, because we're we're only here for about uh, thirty minutes, and I I, um, I think it's important that we, um, you know, we uh, we look at you know to try and explain what we're not going to talk about oh, yep. because it's it's quite broad. So. Um, we're not we're not going to get into the governance of interoperability, the SOPs of interoperability. We're really here to talk about uh, the technology uh, choices that you have yeah. and, and how to migrate between them, right? Exactly. And we will also not talk about chat for interoperability, IOP tests IOP. and things like that. Good. So this is technology interoperability we will cover today. Super. All right. Well, let's let's dive right in there and. Uh, So I, I want to just at this point, I, I want to mention to anyone who in the audience who's interested in getting a copy of these slides that if you if you, you know, stick your name and your email address in the chat, if you're in the swap card um, uh, platform, the chat would appear uh, on the right hand side if you've registered and then you can uh, we can take that information. We'll collect them all uh, over the course of the next few days and and send this out to you. I also understand that these will be uh, ready, uh, I guess, available after the fact as a um, uh, as something that you can go and uh, see as well, but uh, we can get you the slides. And, and if you have any other information, then we'll we'll know where to find you and how to contact you. Um, so, uh, how come maybe you walk us through the uh, the agenda today? Absolutely. So we will first start in explaining what technology streams are available today. So what options, what users are, are on uh, at this time and uh, give us some quick outlook onto the future so how we will probably move into and the next topic is about the interoperability itself so how can we achieve interoperability and then we finally will wrap up and are ready for your questions to have probably good answers good questions first of all and good answers for okay that. super um i'm going to um before too, I, I think I, I what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask the audience if they would uh, share with us if you uh, participate in or are responsible for a, a network of any sort. Take a few minutes if you don't mind. Let us know is it is it analog, is it digital, is it broadband? What's the primary nature of the technology that that you're using today? Again, we'll collect this information over the course of the next few minutes, uh, or the next I guess thirty uh, minutes that we have together. And uh, just to find out, you know, what what is the uh, the audience today? What are they? Um, uh, what what's predominantly out there? What are you dealing with? So, uh, you know, without further ado, we'll 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 jump into that and uh, and talk about um, uh, these um, the technology life cycles that we we experience today. Yeah. So, I mean, if we have to put the available technologies of today into three boxes, then it would be probably analog digital trunking, narrowband, and mission critical PTT slash broadband. Analog uh, is, is on its way out. I think that's fair to say. Nevertheless, it is a huge, huge install base to, even today. Yeah, it's it's been on its way out for, for many years. Oh, like yeah, they, yeah. I, I would imagine. And, uh, you know, again, we've we've uh, we've listened to a number of uh, presentations over the, the, the past couple of days. You know, there's probably 30 or 40 percent of the existing networks today that are still analog. If you go, if you look across the globe, um, I don't think that would be, um, you know, out of reach. No, I think that's the ballpark. And uh, if we then move on, looking into narrowband technologies, I think the major difference is here that we are still on a growing market in narrowband technologies on digital narrowband technologies and narrowband technologies, especially technologies, mission critical technologies like Tetra are here to stay. There's a good reason that they are staying as they are very efficient. We have the, the spectrum uh, available for it and it fulfills uh, the, the customer's needs today. 
and it's and it's it's really about voice at that point, right? You're, you're, you there's a there's a real uh, requirement. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, where you are in the streams. It's about uh, making sure that when you push to talk, uh, you get your message out there. And it's I, I heard it described, you know, these these technologies uh, again in another uh, uh, presentation as as the bedrock service of of all of these things. So yeah. yes, we can get video. Yes, we can get. Uh, we're, we're going to be experiencing AI, but, you know, if we don't have the voice, <clears throat> excuse me, and the ability to uh, communicate to, uh, when we want to, it's, uh, that's really, um, uh, uh, like I said, a bedrock uh, of importance yeah, to users. Yeah. So. so you can say this is, this is the lifeline for, for many users or operations. And of course, Mission Critical PTT is on its way up, and it will certainly play a major role in the future. And it's a very interesting technology and we are leveraging from commercial technology that we are now reusing for public safety, uh, mission critical and business operations. So that, that's a very interesting thing. Um, not many users on mission critical PTT today, but the amount of users are growing. Well, and certainly there's a lot of talk about it, right? Absolutely. I mean, it, I, I, I think you, you, if you look around at the, uh, the themes of some of these uh, presentations, it's, 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 uh, it has to be taken into account. So, Absolutely. you know, we'll find out later on, you know, what we're going to see, who, who our users, um, uh, you know, where they sit. Uh, but it, it, we're going to concentrate on these uh, these three technology cycles, and and really, it, you are where you are. You, you're, um, you know, you're going to find yourself in in one of these three streams. And uh, our what we're um, hoping to do is. Uh, demonstrate how you can uh, interoperate with the other streams uh, one way or the other. Um, okay, eight, there it is. There's the results of the poll. Preliminary, I guess, Bob. Preliminary <laughs> poll, yes. And yes, in, in um, I guess we'll read these out, you know, in, uh, in deference to our Americans uh, on the other side of the ocean who are uh, voting today in their election. But uh, it looks like digital wins the day, 83%. Uh, yeah. of the the people out here and uh, the balance is uh, are using broadband which to me is uh, um, uh, uh, something that is uh, interesting so absolutely um, okay well um, let's let's uh, carry on here so when we're we you know you're in one of these streams Hauke, and uh, uh, now you've, you've got to look at it and say okay wh what it, what are your expectations what are your needs how do you um, uh, how do you define them? And then, if, if we can get some sense of that, then uh, you know we'll uh, we'll be able to address them. Yeah, the the main challenge in switching from one technology to another one is you want to maintain seamless communication. So at any point in time, you want to make sure you can communicate without any limitations. Right. You so, won't you won't sacrifice being able to talk to another network. If, if uh, so, it's got that's got to be the key to the uh, the yeah. whole thing. The, the all all our business is about mission critical or business critical communication. So you can't uh, have have downtime. You can't have any waiting time before the operation can start over again. Um, the next very important point is, of course, to you need to future proof your investment. Uh, budgets are, are important nowadays, and if you spend some money today, you want to make sure it is not lost in five years' time. Yeah, and you, I guess too, you could say in in this environment, there's going to be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, pressure on on uh, on budgets. There, um, you know, given what we have to deal with, it's uh, that's going to be play more of a role. Uh, you're going to have to get your bang for your buck. And if you look into classical PMR business, the expectations of our customers is to have the system at least for 10, 15 years, and often way longer than well, that, even. How could we were talking about this with Simon earlier that that um, you know that some of the expectations are going to 30 years. That that they, there's now they're they're talking about life cycle management. So yeah, it, it, the the pressure is there to make this count for sure. And, and this is a challenge for technology. Having a technology for the next 30 years, look 30 years back, what technology yeah. we had available in that days. Yeah. So there was no USB drives whatsoever. Interesting uh, experience, really. Yes. Um, nevertheless, uh, reasonable cost. Of course, budgets are an issue. You said that earlier. So it needs to be reasonably priced. Sure. Uh, but 
we need also reduce complexity and we don't mean reduce functionality i think we really clearly need to distinguish the two no and i think that that is definitely important we're not we're not talking about uh reducing uh the, what you expect to get um uh, and and reducing the cost it's it's getting all of the features and and having something simple to be able to to work with i think yeah. that's an important uh, exactly piece. the requirements are getting way more um uh, challenging for for having that then you don't want to to um sacrifice the reduce the, this by having more complexity so right. you need to have both reduce replexibility at the same time more powerful features for the users sure the next thing is is you want to have everything based on standards every interface every product you are dealing with is ideally fully standardized Give us an example of that, Helka. I'm thinking about uh, like the Tetra standard. Uh, okay, so, like so DMR Etsy or free GPP. Etsy based free GPP. Okay, good. It's a very important topic because this is, is related to future proof your investment. If it's based on a standard, there's a good chance that it will last longer as it's dedicated for this type of users right. and their needs. Yeah, good point. Um, so, it's very important. And um, beside the standards, it's also important. You want to look for certification. You want to get certified equipment so that it's interoperable with different types of the same piece of equipment working on the same standard. Right. Um, last but not least, of course, we want to build on COTS technology. So every wherever it is possible, of course, there's no base station being COTS, but if you want to place a gateway on the server or something like that, it got you want you'd prefer something that was off the shelf that absolutely. you could go and buy it and and that you're you're not having to build something that's custom. So yeah, yeah no, again, yeah, great point. So, well, uh, let's uh, let's move on. So if if, if that's uh, say a subset or or the the bulk of what we uh, we we understand that the user base needs. Then I, th I think let's look at how we would address those needs using our uh, interoperability toolkit. So, there's let, if if we can break them down into into different um, uh, areas. If if I'm now going back to the 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 concept of if I'm in the analog stream. So we said there were 17 or uh, maybe some late entries, 29 percent of the. Uh, um, oh, there's no one in the analog stream. I'm just being told now. So okay. let's. Uh, <laughs> so, but if, that's if, interesting. If, if there's no one here. But yeah. let's let's presume for the uh, for the time being that you were in the analog stream and you wanted to to move into the digital stream. Yeah. So if 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 you if you're you're doing that, what are your options uh, available to 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 make that happen? So actually, moving from analog to digital is is the simplest of all things in in the portfolio here. Um, you can do it with radio uh, bridges, and this enables you to uh, cross-connect voice communication, enable voice communication, to have simple messaging even available. And it's a very mature products that are available on it. We have our own products, but uh, there are plenty of others even out there as well. So it's not a big deal, but it's an important factor. It's and a building block. How could then the audience would probably experience that in the market as uh, could we say that's like radio over IP ROIP type? Uh, it's exactly technology. that. That's yeah, what it is. That's so. exactly it. Okay, cool. Okay, so in in, in if we were to take take a, a digital to digital use case and be specific, if we had uh, two Tetra networks, uh, which is is probably the case in in uh, uh, you know over uh, 120 countries around the world, this this might be uh, something that you'd find. Exactly, we see that everywhere. And, so um, that that is actually it was a challenge, uh, and we really fought a long time about it, and we came up with a solution for it, and that's called Network Bridge. It's a dumb Tetraflex Network Bridge, and besides it having group communications that were bridged between the two networks, it enables you also to have individual communication. So it retains the full individuality of all subscribers. You can send messages, you have GPS data, you can talk directly privately to each other, but still participating on group calls. Okay. Um, it's an extension of the existing network, basically. Okay, so you, you in that case, you're, you're taking what's there and you're expanding the footprint of it and, and you're making it seamless to uh, the user groups. Exactly. So okay. the, for the user experience, it feels like one bigger network now. Interesting, okay. Um, 
there's another way to, to do something similar, which is based on the inter-system interface, the standard right by, by Etsy standard, um, uh, an interface that enables the communication between two Tetra networks. Very interesting technology. It is um, ideal for situations where you have cross-border communications, or if you're running multiple networks all around the world, and we have customers doing that, and they are interested in having one dispatcher, for example, communicating to all those networks, but they want to retain the, the independency of the own networks. So they Understood. want to take the control over, give handed it over to somebody else. So therefore, it's it's ideal ideal to go with the inter system interface. And, and is that an IP interface? Uh, it's fully IP based. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's a very important thing. There are two versions actually out of uh, ISI, one based on circuit switch technology, which is, yeah, we all know that very outdated. So we don't want to go with that. So of course it is fully IP only okay. support. Good. So the, the third use case that we we're, we're looking at, you're in a, you're in a digital stream, which a, the bulk of our uh, audience is, is obviously familiar with. And, and you, you're, you're looking to um, either connect with or, or take advantage of broadband. And you know, we, we've heard about the mission critical PTT, uh, push to talk apps. Um, how do we do that uh, at DOM? We have two options for that. Um, first of all, we have an integrated solution, which is basically part or not basically, it is part of the existing Tetra infrastructure and they seamlessly connect to broadband and to broadband users so they can interact with tetra with dmr with analog subscribers so and it's, and that 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 you say a broadband user what's the terminal what 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 how does the user experience the network uh, there are them? many ways to doing it you can use your smartphone you can use your iphone if you want um, but most customers are relying on having a professional device. So something that's way more rugged, that has way more loudness, volume, that's capable of generate some noise. And still can do the push to talk. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, Good. And finally, another option for broadband, and I think that's a very important one here. And we, we talked about future proofness earlier. And in order to make a system today future proof, there must be some guarantee that it will support IWF interworking function. This is the gateway, the interconnection towards 3GPP mission critical PTT, mission critical X. So a very important piece and really, really important building block here. Interesting. Thank you. So, you know, we've that, that that's the way we can approach this. Let's uh, let's uh, wrap this up a bit. We did take a, the poll uh, earlier, and I, I don't I don't think we got anything. Uh, any update there, but so for the time being, uh, Hauka, why don't you just summarize the the difference between the bridging solutions and 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 more the direct connect uh, solutions uh, for the audience? Yeah, we we can distinguish between two general options. One is a bridging solution, which is based on on the technologies we decided, uh, we we have seen in one of the first pages. And the big advantage of our bridging solutions is. It is a very reduced complexity. It's very simple to make. It's very cost efficient. And so we are addressing again the needs of the community here. But it has at the same time a very, very comprehensive feature set that it comes along with. And so it's a very easy way for customers to expand their existing coverage. On the other hand, Direct Connect is very important if we look into IWF to have a future proof technology so that we can connect whenever we want to. So it is not that we want to tell our customers, you need to go to broadband, you need to do this and that. We want them to decide whenever they want to change something that we have the right technology on hand. And so we've got a tool to help them enable that. Exactly, okay. so that's, that's our goal. And that's why we believe this is the right technology. And the same goes for the ISI, which is kind of a similar thing if you compare, compare the two. Interesting. Okay. And you still, as, as you pointed out earlier, that when you're connecting those networks, they, that they, they retain their sovereign rights. They're, they're independent of each other and that you just share the, the specific data and, and information that you want to share. It's a very important point. So I think we cannot emphasize that enough. So they stay independent. So it is just that they are collaborating with each other but retain their independency. Yes. Okay. And 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 really, again, to, to reiterate that wherever you find yourself, it, you're going to look at these options and 
and these uh, feature sets and, and determine is it what what's what's for me how how am I going to be able to do this and by no means uh, would we uh, say that one size uh, fits all so um, so why don't we uh, um, take a, a few minutes and just introduce uh, the the third person in the room. <laughs> They are uh, our BS422. Uh, you, you, uh, we, we didn't uh, up front, we didn't man, um, uh, point to it, but this is, uh, this is our base station. It, uh, it is uh, standards based. It's uh, multi-tech and multi-carrier. And maybe how come, maybe you can elaborate a little bit, but not only on you know, what it's capable of, but what, it, what, are, the, what are the benefits that uh, you mean, derive? Yeah, it's a very good point. So we, we talked about interoperability and basically this is really how we created the product. It is interoperability on its own. We have three different standards, main standards. There are more we are supporting, but looking to analog, looking to DMR, looking to Tetra, we can interconnect that. We can interconnect broadband with that platform. Okay. So, um, and it is based on one unified switching platform. So no matter what standard is used by the subscribers, they can collaborate with each other. So when you say uh, no switching platforms, so no gateways, we all of the switching between the technologies is done internally. Exactly. exactly. Interesting. That's, okay. that's the main thing here. All right. And uh, to deal with capacity, we put one on top and said, okay, we need to have it also multi-carrier. And it's multi-carrier, multi-standard, and all at the same time. So if you want to have one carrier being Tetra, one DMR, or another one analog, you can have this really in an ideal um, migration scenario. So if, I was just thinking that the migration tool, if you if you are on an analog system, then you can you can deploy this on existing analog channels and then uh, deploy on the same box. You could put a, a a DMR or perhaps a Tetra carrier on that and and move your groups over as uh, as need be. Exactly. Yeah. So, and then what happens when if if I've got this deployed as an analog device, and I've now I've moved all my groups over to digital, then what? Oh yeah, you just switch off the analog channel and use it for any other purpose you want to. When you say switch it off, are we talking? Is that a big deal? No, it's just one click in the network management, and that is uh, one single management system for the whole platform. Okay. So no matter if it is an analog channel or you want to switch off Tetra which is not likely, but if you want to, you can do it just with a single mouse click. And then how big can these networks get, uh, Hauke? There's no, no limit for it. So we always say you, you grow as you go with the network. And if you need more capacity, you just buy another box and your network gets bigger. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, so I, again, I want to, I want to just reiterate that if you, if you'd like some more information, if you'd, uh, you'd like us to get back to you, or even get copies of these slides sent to you, we would uh, be happy to, to do that. If you just drop your name and your email address into the chat on the uh, swap card platform, that'll uh, help us collect that data and get it out to you. But I think we're, we're, we're running up against some time here. I think maybe uh, we should take a, a, a couple of questions. Uh, do you think that uh, would work? Yeah, let's see, are there some questions? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> okay, I hope so too. Um, there's oh, there's yes. one there. Okay. So let's th let's take this one here. All right. Will the ISI and IWF support end-to-end -end encryption? Oh, that's an interesting one, really. Uh, and always, if you talk about different technologies, end-to-end -end encryption is a tricky bit. Um, but on ISI, no matter what, of course, it is fully supported over there. On IWF, I must say it depends. The standard is ready, almost ready for it, I must say. Um, but it uh, requires that both endpoints are using the same type of voice stream. So ACAP codec on one side and also on the other side, so to make it compatible. So it, what what level of encryption? So it would would um, ISI, What do you know, How what level of encryption it would uh, support? Uh... It is independent. It's fully end to end. So you can put whatever encryption you want on top of it. Okay. So if you want to have uh, 256 AES encryption on it, you can do it. If you want to make the key stream longer, yeah, you're free to do that. Okay. It's totally out of the scope of the of the of the carrion system. So it is just forwarding what comes in to the endpoints. Okay. All right. Let's grab. What's another one there? It's. Uh, uh, 
Can you support a simulcast network uh, that uses both the DMR tier three and analog? Oh yeah. Uh, yes, we can actually. Yeah, so yeah. That's the the, uh, the simulcast. That was a question that we got. Um, uh, we had in our earlier uh, uh, in our earlier uh, session as well, which um, actually we're going to repeat them both tomorrow too, if uh, if you've missed any of them. But um, so yeah, can if we've got a DMR tier three uh, in analog, that that's that's possible with our technology. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. it's exactly designed in that way so that we uh, have no limits whatsoever. So whenever you want to do something, it is available. Mm -hmm. And you can operate each carrier, no matter what standard it is, and say, I want to have it in frequency sharing mode or simulcast mode and have one other in parallel working on Tetra. So that, yeah, that sort of bridges what we were talking about with Simon uh, this morning. So the, the, you've got a, a standalone uh, DMR tier three network, and then you can put a section of that network um, create a larger bubble with um, with some base stations that are are using the frequency sharing uh, uh, simulcast. Uh, exactly. Type, uh, yeah, it is just the way it works. It's just we are giving a, a group ID for for simulcast and every base station using the same ID is just dialing into that communication stream. And and then if you needed if you needed, I guess, then using the uh, the uh, the licensing elements, you can change uh, the, that hardware from a uh, frequency sharing device to a standalone base station simply uh, exactly. the, using the licensing element. Good. The, the hardware stays the same always. Okay, so here, here's a here's another question that we got. Uh, it says, does DAMS ISI support both circuit switched and IP based uh, connectivity? Yeah, cool question. I think we covered it earlier, but it, it was probably put into the chat a little bit earlier. So no, it is, of course, we, we only support IP based uh, communication. So there's no uh, option for circuit switch technology. And, and will there, I mean, is that, uh, that would be an issue if the system that you were connecting to the, um, the if they only had that yeah, then uh, it is. Um, so you need two systems yeah. that are going to be able to support a, an IP based. Uh, okay. Correct. Um, I mean, to be fair, nowadays there are hardly any circuit switch systems available. So most of them are fully on IP running. So it should be not a big deal. And uh, if it is not available, then there's still the other bridging technologies available that you can rely on. Certainly, there would be none of this talk with the uh, IWF, correct? Sorry, Alka. Okay. Is there any other manufacturer currently offering a solution like this? Now that that is a good question. Not that we're aware of, Alka. Yeah, I, I don't think that's what to uh, say. I think uh, in that in that form, how we designed the portfolio, we are not aware about any of us. Uh, but maybe some somebody else knows better. We are not aware of anything else. Well, and I, I guess you know to drill down on that question, it, you, we'd have to pick out some of the things from the toolkit because. Radio over IP, you know, there are lots of, uh, there are lots okay, of, yeah. so, but if you, if you look at, if you, if you were to take the BS422 as a piece of technology, it's, uh, we got to say it's, uh, we think it's uh, one of the most unique pieces of technology in the industry, so. But it's an important point. I was totally referring to the BS422. Yeah. Radio over IP, I think that's, yeah, no, the, there are I think we've got solutions. It, yeah, there's, there's different ways. So uh, definitely in our, our hardware, and our software. Well, I think uh, I think that ends. Oh no! It looks like we got another we'll question, another a late one. question coming in. So, okay. Okay. Um, oh, I can't, can't read, read it. that. <laughs> That's okay. Well, listen. Uh, we'll. Uh, you know what we'll do is we, uh, we change the laptop to us now. So let's improvise a little bit here. So where is it? Um, what obstacles do you see for encryption key distribution between ISI and IW, particularly with <laughs> okay, sure, yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a that's, that is, a that's a challenge, and there's still outstanding work, and uh, of course that needs to be carefully considered. And um, but there are ways to do it. It is not impossible, but of course this is this is a challenge for that type of technology. And I, I think that's uh, there's there's lots of work to be done on the three GPP side to uh, to facilitate that. Again, yeah. you know, also I've, on I've, the users' organization, yeah, all and of how that. to collaborate. Yeah, that. it's uh, the, these things aren't aren't simple. And I, I, I I've been uh, listening through some of the other presentations, and uh, you know, I as I, these are concerns. So. 
again, we're, we're not we're not suggesting for a moment that everything is uh, uh, is working the way we want it. We have a toolkit when we use our toolkit, and at the at the heart of that is our BS four two two. We believe you've got a lot of options. So. Um, Anyway, I think uh, I think that's going to bring us to the end of our session. I want to say thanks uh, to the audience and uh, remind you to throw your uh, uh, email address into the chat and we'll get back to you. Have a great rest of the show. Thank you. Goodbye.